I would like to thank each of you for joining us today for our second Global Hospitality Spotlight event presented in partnership with Hotels Magazine and the Illinois Hotel and Lodging Association. In the audience today, we have a wonderful mix of industry professionals from Chicago's top hotel and hospitality associations. We have advisory board members, as well as our Eta Sigma Delta Honor Society students, School of Hospitality Management faculty and staff. But I'm also pleased to tell you that for the first time, it doesn't stop there. We've made this event available to viewers around the world who are watching it live online. As some of you know, Kendall College is a member of the Laureate International Universities Network, which includes institutions recognized as the very best in the world of higher education and hospitality management. We are streaming this event live to more than 1,000 students and faculty at members of our sister schools around the world, including campuses in Brazil, Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica, Portugal, and Spain. To our guests online, we're so glad that you could join us virtually for this inaugural event, and I hope to welcome you to our campus in Chicago one day very soon. Now, a little bit about Kendall. For those who may be just a little bit unfamiliar, our, mess, our, our mission is to cultivate our students' passions into rewarding prof uh, professions through rigorous learning experiences in the classroom, local communities, and around the world. Kendall College was ranked the number one program in Chicago for preparing students for hospitality management and culinary arts careers by Chicago's leading hotel and Michelin Guide restaurants. We are so proud of this recognition and know it wouldn't be possible without the support of many of you, our alumni, our colleagues throughout the hospitality industry in Chicago and beyond. Before we get started, I just have one small housekeeping note. If you're tweeting about today's event, please use the hashtag KC Spotlight, which you can reference at the bottom of the menu on your table. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Jeff Weinstein, who is the editor in chief of Hotels Magazine and a member of our School of Hospitality Management Advisory Board. He has taken a very active role in helping us plan today's event. In addition to moderating the Q&A session this morning, I would like to ask Jeff to please come up and introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Jeff Connolly, author and founder of Joie de Vivre Hotels. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. All of you out in the uh, watching virtually, you're missing a beautiful day here. The view outside the windows here is amazing. You can see the entire city and what a beautiful city it is today. Um, we are all very lucky to be here today to hear from Chip Connolly. I've, I've known Chip for close to 20 years. Um, and Chip, I found out this morning, has created more boutique hotels than anybody in the world. And, and Chip does things differently. Um, you can think about some of the other innovators and, and you think about people like Ian Schrager and Bill Kimpton and other Americans who have been known for developing boutiques, but Chip does things differently. He's, he's got a very unique edge and approach to hotel keeping and his philosophy about mentoring his people and, and, and creating a culture that, that really creates an environment where people can aspire to greatness, not only his, his people who work for him, but his guests. And here's an example of what Chip has done differently. When he created his hotels, he used the idea of magazine titles. And he would take five adjectives that probably best describe the magazine and, and applied them to the hotel concept that he was creating. And he found that people who love his hotels are people who use those adjectives to, you know, for their own aspirations and to describe themselves. And I can't imagine anybody else in the hotel industry thinking that way. He's always got a little different approach. And I think Chip is also known for his creative leadership as well. Uh, and in fact, he's written two books and they're known to address how, how key st stakeholders are ultimately motivated by peak experiences that address their higher unspoken needs. And I'm sure he's going to explain a little bit, about more, little bit more about that this morning as he, as he gives his, his speech. Um, I'm always fascinated by his approach. Uh, he had a, a wonderful tableau of San Francisco, uh, which is certainly an edgy town, to, to develop his concepts. And no doubt he has been imitated uh, by, by hoteliers worldwide with his, with his approach to hotel keeping. And I, I know he's going to give you a little bit more about that today. It's my privilege to introduce uh, 
uh, somebody I consider an industry icon. And, and Chip, my, my privilege to introduce you today here at Kendall College. So if I'm an icon, that means I'm old. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. You know, I appreciate it. I really do. I am old. I've been doing this half of my life. I'm 51 years old, and I started the company when I was 26. So uh, I have been doing it for half of my life. First of all, for those of you in Ecuador, I was there three days ago. I loved it. Thank you. I uh, really enjoyed my time in Peru and Ecuador. I was giving a bunch of speeches in, in South America and then experiencing all the beauty that's in places like the Galapagos and Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. So, so there's a slide. Actually, should I, should I go straight to that? Or is it, do you pull it up there? We'll see, we'll see it in just a moment. Uh, yeah, it's sort of hard to see. Go back one. Oops, back. That right there. Can you see that sort of? Well, it says the powerful intersection of psychology and business. And for the next half hour, that's what I'm going to talk about. And it's not lost on me that I, that I use the word intersection. It's the actual location. In intersection, if you're driving in a car, it's the most dangerous place where you could drive a car. More accidents happen at intersections than any other place on the highway. So appropriate to use the word intersection to describe psychology and business, because quite often it's a dangerous intersection, psychology and business. How do we actually get along in the workplace? How do we understand our fellow employees? How do we understand our customers? How do we even understand the psychology of the investors who invest in our hotels? My belief is instead of this, this intersection being a dangerous intersection, it's actually the intersection that could be your insurance policy for creating a very successful career in leadership. If you can understand people, you can understand business. And that's been my experience. Now, I went to Stanford undergrad, and I went to Stanford Business School. And when I was at Stanford Business School, they did not teach me that. They taught me that the way you understood business is you got really good at, back then, Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheets. This was a long time ago. And you got really good at writing a strategic marketing plan and developing a business plan and going out and asking for investors for money. Uh, but the reality is what I've learned in 25 years of doing this is that understanding people is the absolute best way to understand business and to be successful in business. So I'm going to talk about that in the context of two psychologists today. Um, not my therapist or anything like that. I'm not, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring my therapist along. Actually, I don't have a therapist right now. I haven't had one for years. It's amazing. I've got, I seem to you know, get along without them these days. Um, but I'm going to talk about how to understand psychology and how to apply that to your relationships in business. So, and I'm thrilled I've got four of my, a bunch of my teammates from the Jodavie in the back there. So you can raise your hands back there. Um, we've just opened a hotel uh, here in Chicago called the Hotel Lincoln uh, in Lincoln Park area. We're perennial. It's, it used to be called perennial, now it's called perennial Verant. Uh, yes. Uh, and we'll have a rooftop lounge and bar opening in about a month there with a stunning view of the lake. So um, we're really excited to be in Chicago. Okay, so that's my mentor but he's no longer living. Um, Abe Maslow, Abraham Maslow, how many of you have, are some, have some familiarity with Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs? Okay, you're a smart group. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna you know, spend too much time on this, but let me just explain. James Lim, who's been with the company off and on, when did you first start with the company, James? 2000. 2000. So he came to the company just as we were about to go into the dot-com bust in the Bay Area. So I started, I started Joie de Vivre in San Francisco in 1987. And um, we grew, and we grew, and we grew. And we grew to be the largest hotelier in the Bay Area with 20 hotels around the Bay Area, which was a great thing in year 2000 when James joined us because in 2000, there was still a dot-com boom. And then the boom became a bust in 2001. And everything that could go wrong did go wrong in 2001. We had the dot-com bust. We had 9-11. 
And after 9-11, nobody really wanted to jump on an airplane anytime soon. Then we created more of a fortress America because uh, for security and safety reasons, made it a lot harder for people to visit the US, uh, which was not good. It didn't affect Chicago all that much because Chicago, while it does get a lot of international visitors, it's much more of a domestic uh, travel town. San Francisco, on the other hand, is a very international destination. And as soon as you create a more challenging environment to come visit the US internationally, you lose a lot of customers. That's what happened to us in San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. What else happened? We had a war, we had, you know, we had a, a recession. Then we had, we had the first war with the, uh, the Afghanis. Then we had the second war with the Iraqis. Um, but we also had a war with the French. Remember that? We stopped eating something in this country. Or actually we called it something. We'll never stop eating it. But we, start, we called it something different. What, we, what was it? Freedom fries. And we started boycotting French companies in the United States. I know some of you don't remember this, but this was in 2002, 2003. Actually, it was 2003 in particular. And that was when I really wished I hadn't named my company Joie de Vivre. <laughs> French name. So I would get these emails from, I don't know, places like Willamette. I think I would get them. <laughs> and from uh, Alabama, and they'd write and they'd say, we don't like you Frenchies, we're gonna stop using your hotel chain because you're all based in France and, we, and you guys are you know, anti-US. Anti and I would write them back and I'd say, wait a minute, we're not based in France, we're an American company, we're based in San Francisco. <laughs> and then I'd get this terse response back in the email saying, San Francisco question mark, Oh, that's worse. <laughs> San Francisco sort of left of Paris. Um, long story short is we were in a lot of trouble in 2001, 2003, because in, in between 2001 and 2006, the San Francisco Bay Area experienced the largest percentage revenue drop in the history of American hotels since World War II, other than through natural disaster. So for, for non-natural disaster, no no economy in the country had ever experienced what we experienced. It was like a depression uh, during, during that time. And we were the largest hotelier in the region, and we had no hotels outside the region. So we had all of our eggs in the wrong basket. That's why one day I decided to go to a local bookstore uh, looking for a business book that was going to help me to understand how to get through this difficult time. Um, and within about five minutes in the business section of the bookstore, I, ended up, I decided I'm in the wrong part of the bookstore, and I went to the self-help section of the bookstore. <laughs> and that's where I got reacquainted with this guy, not in person, he died in 1970, but with his quite iconic and famous Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Now, I sat there for four hours on the floor at Borders Bookstore, Union Square, which no longer exists, and I was reading two or three of his books. I had taken only one psychology class in college. But what I remember from that one psychology class was that there was this one psychologist in the mid 20th century who was more focused on best practices in, human, in the human behavior and condition as opposed to worst practices. Generally, psychologists have had a tendency to focus on people who are in trouble and how do we fix them. Maslow came along in the 1940s and he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. You've heard that expression before. It was Maslow who first said it. And he said it because he thought the psychology profession was so focused on fixing broken people that they weren't focusing on healthy, flourishing people and let's study them and maybe we can apply what we learn from them to the people who are broken. And that's, how, that's why he created this. He studied a thousand people who are flourishing found that all of us, no matter where we live in the world, have four basic needs that we have to have met. Some of you will sneak a fifth need in there, but you, can, you, don't, you don't die if you don't have that, but I won't get into that one. Um, food, sleep, air, and water. Food, sleep, air, and water. We all need that. You cannot live without that. Once those needs, those needs are partially met, you move up to the safety level, social belonging level, the esteem level, and at the top of the pyramid was this thing called self-actualization being all you can be. What Maslow said is that when people really are in their most flourishing, wonderful state, they feel like they are being all they can be, and they've sort of figured out their purpose and why they're here on the planet. So I'm reading this at a time when 
we're in a lot of trouble as a company. And I didn't know how we were going to make payroll in about four months. Uh, but I did remember what I loved about reading Maslow is Maslow helped me remind, remind me that when I started Joie de Vivre, and I called it that, Joy of Life in French, it was with the intent of being self-actualized. I had no language for it. I didn't say, oh, I'm, I'm doing this to become a self-actualized individual. I didn't think that at all. But I did realize that that was sort of what was going on for me. So I asked myself, wow, if, if individuals can be self-actualized, what if you put together a collection of individuals in the context of a company? Could you create a self-actualized company? And I decided with our senior team in the company that we would try that. We would try to say, let's take Maslow's hierarchy of needs and apply it to our organization. So we took Maslow's pyramid and turned it into a three-level pyramid. Um, because actually five levels, you know, the hospitality business, we don't like numbers. I'm sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> but no, I, we do like numbers. We better like numbers, frankly, because the nature of the hospitality business has become very numbers driven. But I liked the idea that there were three basic themes in Maslow's pyramid. There's survival, which is levels one and two, physiological and safety needs. There's success. When you feel successful in life, it's usually related to levels three and four. Your social belonging needs or your esteem needs are being met. And then at the top of the pyramid, when you're feeling self-actualized, you feel transformed. So this pyramid, what I call the transformation pyramid, survival, succeed, transform, is a paradigm for looking at life. You could look at a date you're going to have tomorrow night, Saturday night, and say, is it a survival date? Is it a succeed date? Or is it a transformational date? You give a family vacation that way. You can look at your work this way. So we started applying this pyramid to our three most important stakeholders, our employees, our customers, and our investors. And I'm going to just take you through two of those three uh, pyramids for a moment. This is the employee pyramid. So survival, succeed, transform, job, career, calling. There are only three kinds of relationships you can have with your work. It's either a job, it's a career, or it's a calling. And it matches these three levels. What's interesting is what this pyramid helped us to see is something that we already sort of intuitively knew as a company, but it, we ha didn't have a language for it. What it helped us to see is that money is the baseline that every employee is looking for from their work. And a lot of us as leaders think that the number one reason that people leave their job in the US is because of money issues or compensation issues. And in fact, that's wrong. It's fourth place in the US. The fourth most likely reason a person leaves their job is because of money or compensation issues. It's not first place. What's first place? What's the number one reason people leave their job in the US? Their manager. Their manager, yeah. People join a company and they leave their boss. So, Second level of this pyramid is where the loyalty happens. So the loyalty, yeah, is, I mean, if, if you're making barely enough to pay your rent, then money's going to be a predominant uh, need. But as you make enough to pay the rent and you start looking at other things, there's other needs that grow. And one of them is feeling recognized, especially by your boss, but by the company as a whole, by an organization that sort of says, we want to train you and develop you and grow you, um, by your peers. To create a culture of recognition as an organization is one of the best things an organization can do is because it actually, when you feel recognized by your peers, you recognize them back. It becomes a sort of a contagious effect, just like the opposite happens. When you feel like everybody is out to get you, you come to work with daggers in your pockets. Um, and that's how man most workplaces work. So recognition was the second level. But the third level is where the magic happens, transformation. When someone has an inspiration for the, the work that they're doing, uh, they find great meaning in what they're doing and at work with the people they're working with and with the organization. If you as a leader can help create an environment where people feel a sense of calling in what they do, the big difference between this level and these two levels down here, money and recognition, is money and recognition are external motivators. I give you this, you give me something in return. I'm the employer, I will give you money and recognition, I expect great work in return. External motivation. When you are creating an environment where people have a sense of internal motivation based upon the meaning that they get and how they feel about their work and the inspiration, wow, 
you've now moved from a bartering relationship to a relationship where your people are actually fueling their own best performance. Think about Southwest Airlines and the flight attendants on Southwest versus the flight attendants on United. Right? <laughs> yeah. The difference between a job and a calling. Those flight attendants, and here's the big difference between a job and a calling. And I was saying to, at, at breakfast earlier with the, the, the small team I was having breakfast with that um, they've done a bunch of studies in the US uh, of hospitals. The number one variable for a successful hospital in the US is how happy are the nurses. There's all kinds of variables, but interestingly enough, the number one variable for successful hospitals is how happy are the nurses. And what they showed was that the difference between a happy nurse and an unhappy nurse is the difference between someone who has a job, unhappy nurse, and someone who has a calling. The, the person who has the calling thinks of their work not as just being a nurse, but being the patient advocate. So the big difference, and I'll just sort of sum up here to say, the big difference in terms of leadership, of helping people move from a job to a calling, helping flight attendants at Southwest move from just like, OK, let's get all those bags on, on board, to feeling like, OK, I'm here to actually help people feel safe and happy and have a good time in the air, is helping people to move beyond the tasks that they're doing and focus on the purpose and the impact that they're having with their work. And that could be helping, on a regular basis, introduce the staff to customer feedback, maybe even having customers come into a staff meeting and say why they love your hotel, you love your restaurant, love your spa. Um, it could be, how, how do you help people feel like their work is not just a series of tasks, so they have an opportunity to have a voice. Something we started doing during the, that downturn 10 years ago is we started doing these service retreats where we would take line level staff from the hotel off-site for the day. You know, usually you know, retreats are always management retreats. Well, what if we took some line level staff off-site and have them help discover what our strategy for the year and help create what our strategy for the year is going to be for a hotel. So helping people think bigger and more broadly about their work, even if it's a housekeeper. Um, you know, a housekeeper is cleaning toilets for a living. How do you help them feel like they have more than just a job? You do that well, you create an environment where people are moving up the pyramid. And if you move people up the pyramid, this pyramid, um, you're creating an environment where more and more people are just internally motivated by what they're doing, and that's a great thing. One other pyramid I'll show you, and this is the customer pyramid. So customers, the baseline, the survival need for a customer is please meet my expectations. Think about yourself as a customer. Whether you're a customer at a dry cleaner or a resort or, I don't know, a, a, a shoe shop. You have a baseline of expectations of what you're looking for. And that's actually, if you, get, if you get those needs met, just your expectations met, then you've had a survival experience, meaning you're, you're at least satisfied. And 25 years ago, creating customer satisfaction, the base of this pyramid, was enough to create loyalty. But post-internet, or in the internet era, not anymore. Customers who are just barely satisfied defect. They do not come back because they have a lot more choices and they find those choices on the internet. So understanding your customers, I, I've said for a long time, as Jeff said, I mean, back 25 years ago when I started the company and then we grew the first hotel, the first funky little motel in a bad neighborhood, against all odds, became successful as a rock and roll hotel. I said the best talent of a hotelier is to be a cultural anthropologist. <laughs> and what I meant by that is you've got to understand your customers, what their expectations are what their desires are. That's the next level here is, what are the desires of a customer? And how are those different than the expectations? In the context of a hotel, th the truth is, the more money you're paying as a customer, the higher your expectations. So it's like the expectations are huge. The desires are a step above that. And if you can deliver on the customer desires, it creates a more committed customer. Because you say, wow, I had expectations here, but you, you exceeded my expectations and you met some of my desires. But it's a very interesting question to ask with your team, what's the difference between an expectation of our customers and a desire? And if you can actually start delivering on the desires more even, you can actually help move the customer up the pyramid. 
But the magic again happens at the top of the pyramid. There are some companies out there that are mind readers. Apple is a mind reader. They un Apple does not do focus groups. They have, they have never done a focus group. In fact, there's a great quote from Henry Ford from 100 years ago. He said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. <laughs> so Henry Ford didn't do any focus groups either. At the top of this pyramid, your customer has a set of unrecognized needs that they can't even articulate. But if you delivered on them, they'd say, wow. At our Hotel Vitali, we created a, uh, a yoga studio in a financial district hotel. That doesn't make sense. Financial district hotels are supposed to be business oriented. Why would anybody ever want to go to a yoga studio in a financial district hotel? Yet, it was an unrecognized need of customers. Um, we created one of our hotels, the Knob Hill Lamborn, that's now a condo project. Um, but back in the day, we, we created, it was the first hotel in the US that had high speed internet access in every guest room in 1994, before any of us were actually on the internet. But what we knew is it was an unrecognized need of the customer that was coming. So imagining what the customer wants before they've even asked for it and delivering on it is what creates evangelical customers, customers that will go out and tell their friends. And in the era of TripAdvisor, that's your marketing plan. It's all about your customers. All right, so that's it. That's all I'm going to talk about on Maslow. How to understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs and applying it to business. That's the full package. For those of you who say, wow, this is a lot of interesting stuff, go out and read Peak. I wrote a book called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow. It's not with us here today. My newest book, Emotional Equations, is here, is here today. But you know, go out and read Peak. Some of the guys in the back have definitely read Peak. And it's, you know, it's appropriate for any industry, but particularly hospitality. OK. Now. This is another Jewish psychologist. <laughs> I hang out with the Jewish shrinks. Um, this is Viktor Frankl. Uh, long story short is during the last downturn, the dot-com bust, which was really in the Bay Area like a depression, uh, you know, I got my rear end kicked. But I learned a lot. And we as a team, our team together, came together and created something rather miraculous. We didn't have any economic layoffs. A lot of all of our competitors did. We ended up tripling in size and revenues during 2001 to 2007. Then we decided, let's grow faster. And between 2007, January 2007, and September of 2008, we launched or relaunched after a renovation 15 hotels in a 21 month period around California. That's a lot. That's a lot especially with a major great recession coming aboard, coming along. So in early 2008, after we had launched many of those hotels, it was starting to become very apparent to me that we had really bad timing with this major growth initiative because this recession that was starting to become apparent in early 2008 looked like it was going to be really ugly. And as it turns out, it was very ugly. So in early 2008, my psychology personally was pretty ugly. Um, I, my meaning in life was a little bit off. And it was partly because I was the CEO of a company. And I felt like, wow, I don't even know if, I can, if I'm the right person to be running this business anymore. Partly because I, you know, for me, it had been an absolute calling. And now it felt more like a job. Not because anybody had done anything wrong, but just because I, I think I found a new calling and I loved writing. And I loved writing these books. And I had written Peak. Peak had come out in September of 2007, right in the middle of all this, all the launches. And I just was, I guess I was clear. You know, it's, it's a hard, it's hard. And I'm, you know, no one's going to cry for a CEO, that's for sure. And they shouldn't. Um, but it is hard for anyone at all to get up and go to work when you know you're not the right person for the job anymore and you don't like what you're doing anymore. I liked pieces of it. I loved hanging out with James. I loved hanging out with people in the company. And they, I hope, still know that. But I also knew what the company needed was not what I could give it. And I also knew we were running out of cash again. Damn, we had had that experience before. But we were running out of cash again. Because the company that I was really the, I, I was the shareholder of the company. Um, each in, individual hotel was a different owner. But the management company, which at that point had almost 3,500 employees, 
That was me. And I don't have deep pockets. I have okay pockets, but not that deep. So long story short is I knew that, that you know, I should be doing something different, but the last thing I could ever do was to go say, oh, I'll go float my resume right now. <laughs> Couldn't really float your resume when you're the founder and CEO of a company that you own. Um, so I just needed to put my seatbelt on and stick in that chair. Uh, but I also knew there were a bunch of other stuff happening in my life. I was I, a long-term relationship ending. I had a son going to prison wrongfully. Went to San Quentin prison. He was in prison for eight months until a federal judge let him out and said, he's not guilty. Let him out. But you know, how would you like to have your son in prison for eight months? Uh, in San Quentin, no less, with murderers. Um, it was really hard. So I started reading Viktor Frankl's book. Now, Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, probably the most famous book ever written on the subject of meaning. Uh, and I, was re I started reading it because I said, wow, I just sort of want to understand my meaning. In fact, I was having such, so many bad days in a row, a friend of mine said to me, you've read this book before, Chip, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a great book to read when you're depressed or upset about your life, because then you read about his life, and you say, oh my god, my life is so good. <laughs> This poor guy, 1930s psychologist from Vienna, who believed that the fuel of life was meaning, well, he ended up in a concentration camp to test his theory. Is, is meaning the fuel of life? Um, and his book is really the story of what it was like to live in the concentration camp and then what his theory of meaning is. So I was reading that book, um, and then and I was struggling. I was, I was really struggling. April 30th, 2008, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, giving speeches. So yes, I was running the company, and I had this book come out, and it became a bestseller, Peak, and I was going around the country giving speeches. So it was a very disjointed life. And April 30th, 2008, I was in um, St. Louis, Missouri, and I got a call from the CEO of our insurance, bro the insurance, broker company, insurance brokerage firm that we work with, and they said, you know, the CEO called me and said, you got to sit down. And he told me about my friend Chip. Now, this is, <laughs> I'm not schizophrenic, but um, <laughs> this is a different Chip. This is not me. <laughs> this is, I, you know, this is my friend Chip in a high school picture of his. His name's Chip Hankins. He was our uh, insurance broker. And he was my friend for, you know, many, many, over a dozen years. He was insur our insurance broker for a dozen years. And when I was having a bad day, I would call Chip up and say, hey, you know, let's go for a walk. He was a really good counselor, along with being an insurance broker. Well, on April 30th, 2008, I got a call from his uh, CEO saying, I hate to tell you this, but Ch Chip committed suicide. Chip took his own life. It was like a shock. And, and I had to go up and give a speech on stage like 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. So what I learned, uh, you know, a month later, we had a, he and his wife and two kids lived in New Zealand. They'd moved there because his wife was uh, Kiwi. And so we had his memorial service about a month later, and it was you know, really hard to go to a memorial service for a friend who's committed suicide. Harder still when they have the same name you have, and everybody's going up and giving their chip stories, and harder even a little still when you're a little depressed at that time. Uh, but it really got me more, even more motivated to, to read some Viktor Frankl. And so I kept reading Viktor Frankl. And then about a month later, I broke my ankle playing baseball. I had a cut on my leg that I didn't realize I had. I got fertilizer in my leg, which is not, you don't want to get fertilizer in your leg. So I, I got a, uh, what's called a septic situation, where my leg blew up to twice its normal size. They put me on antibiotics. And then stupid me decided, okay, well, I'm supposed to go and be on a little book tour, go to St. Louis and Toronto and Houston. And on crutches and on antibiotics, I went onto a plane. And, and went off to St. Louis. And while I was in St. Louis again, and I promise you I'm never going to St. Louis ever again in my life. I only get bad news there. Um, and at St. Louis in August of 2008, uh, I gave a speech. It's the first speech of the tour. And at the end of my speech, up on stage, when I was signing books, I went unconscious for about three minutes. Fortunately, the paramedic showed up because a minute after the paramedic showed up, I went flatline. So I, d I died on stage. <laughs> you don't want to die on stage. <laughs> um, so long story short, because I'm, I'm running late on time, I, I, um, they revived me. I lived. I'm, I'm here to talk about it. But while I was in Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, uh, after being in the emergency room for a few hours, 
I didn't have a heart attack. They still don't know what happened to me. I had divine intervention is what I call it. Uh, at, what I learned at that point was I need to learn Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, that book on psychology. I need to apply it in my own life. So I turned it into an equation. Oops. Gosh, you can barely see that. I call it emotional equations. I turned it into an equation. Despair equals suffering minus meaning. Now, I'm going to go through it really quickly. And for you, those of you who want to really learn more about it, they've got books in the back. But suffering when you're going through a difficult time in a concentration camp, my son in prison, me in a mental prison, uh, whatever's going on, when you're going through a difficult time, suffering is ever present. In fact, in the Buddhist uh, philosophy and religion, it's the first noble truth of Buddhism that suffering is ever present. So if you think of suffering as a constant and you think of meaning as a variable and you increase the meaning, the despair goes down. And I started using that on a daily basis. I started asking myself at the end of a bad day, and there are a lot of bad days in 2008, the latter part of 2008, I would come home and I would just say, what did I learn today? What was my meaning? What was my lesson? What emotional skills did I learn today? And it started to work. I started feeling less despair. I felt more meaning. And then we started even applying it in the company a little bit. There was a, a retreat. We had a management retreat in, Saint, in Santa Cruz where I started introducing some of these equations, or one of these equations in particular, this one, to some of the managers. And I said, we're going to go into 2009 and have a really rough year. Uh, because the budget, we went into the year with budgets that thought may, there might be a 2 or 3% drop in revenues, and there was a 22% drop in revenues in the markets we were in. Uh, so what meaning was the team going to get? Abraham, Abraham Maslow said, great leaders create great psycho hygiene. And what he meant by that is that when things are going really badly, or when it's very much sort of a difficult environment at work, you learn how to bathe together, not, not literally, but figuratively, and you have a catharsis. And you have a sense of, OK, we can breathe together, and we're all in this together. And when you create that kind of environment, even if it's a difficult time, people will say, you know what? I'm going to learn more in this period of time than I'll ever learn the rest of my life. And as a leader, that's what you try to do, rather than creating a fear environment where people just get more scared and stop breathing. So this worked. I'll show you just two other ones quickly, and then I'll sum up. Uh, happiness. I went to Bhutan to study the Gross National Happiness Index, amazingly, for, 40 years ago. This is a country that said, well, GDP is not that important. G, uh, it was GNP then. How about GNH, Gross National Happiness? So happiness is really about wanting what you have or practicing gratitude. Four different continents, they've shown the same thing. Four different continents. Fastest way to feel happy if you're unhappy is to feel gratitude and express it. It's the fastest way. Four different continents. So this is a culturally across, across all kinds of psychology and all kinds of people. The problem with the happiness equation is not in the numerator, the top. It's in the denominator. It's the pursuing gratification. It's the having what we want. We as humans are built to want things. And, as so, and you say, oh, I want that. OK, I'm going to go over and get it. And as soon as you get that, oh, it's OK. I don't like it quite as much. Now I want that. We do this with marriages and relationships and things like that, too. <laughs> so we get so focused on the pursuit of our gratification, we lose track of the practicing of gratitude and appreciating what we do have. OK, last one, anxiety. <laughs> Anybody feel that the last four years? Um, anxiety. There are two ingredients that actually create anxiety. What we don't know and what we can't control. Uncertainty times powerlessness. Once you know that, once you actually understand the ingredients of anxiety, you have an ability to control anxiety. And it has a lot to do with just figuring out how do you actually focus on what you do know and how do you focus on what you can influence. I don't have time to go over. Maybe in Q&A, if anybody has a question at the very end, we can ask about that. Or I'll be here reciting books, too. For 24 years, I was the CEO of the company that I founded. And I was the chief executive officer, because that's what we call CEOs, chief executive officers. But what I've come to learn in 24 years of being a chief executive officer is that CEOs are really chief emotions officers. <laughs> and that if you don't realize, as a leader, that you are the emotional thermostat of the group that you're leading, 
then you're going to have some very unintended emotional consequences in your organization. Three pieces of da data that back this up. Daniel Goleman wrote a book 17 years ago called Emotional Intelligence in which he proved that two-thirds of the success of business leaders and organizational leaders has to do with their EQ, their emotional intelligence, and only one-third has to do with their IQ or their level of experience in the work. Secondly, very smart man there, looking a little crazy. When we're feeling crazy and we make decisions from that crazy reactive state, you've never done that, right? You've never, you know, like been angry and then made a decision or be, been anxious and made a decision or made, been jealous and said something. When we do that, when we actually live in a reactive state, which is how we tend to live with our emotions, if we make a decision in that state, we're using 10 to 15 less IQ points when we're making the decision. Because we're using the amygdala, which is the caveman part of our brain, the, the fight or flight part of our brain. If you just even say to yourself, I feel angry right now, or I feel jealous, or I feel you know, disappointed, just even naming it, the, the, the emotion allows you to actually get to the prefrontal cortex up here, which is what gets you your IQ back. Because for many of us in this room, losing 10 to 15 IQ points when we're making decisions is not a very smart <laughs> proposition. So um, that's the second piece. Third piece, a beautiful pond. That's like a company or an organization. An organization is like a pond. That's how I think of it. And a pond can also look like this, a polluted pond. And all it takes is a little bit of people being upset in a pond to pollute the pond. Our emotions are just as contagious as the flu. If there's anxiety in an organization and we're not doing a good job as a leader of figuring out how to deal with the anxiety, we pollute the pond. And if you pollute a pond, you know, you can, it takes a lot, a lot of time to clean up a pond. Uh, it doesn't take much time to pollute a pond. So emotions are really important as a, con a context for that organizational pond that we live in. Just to sum up, the most neglected fact in business is that we're all human. <laughs> just that little known fact that you'd forgotten about. Um, and that's what I want to end with, is just to say that you know, if you think that the way you're going to be successful as a business leader is to just be the best tactician in the world, and technical skills are going to actually be what's going to take you to the top, technical skills will take you to the top of middle management. And if it takes you any further than that, and you don't have EQ, you will get spit out within a year or two years. Um, so you may grow without EQ and just with technical skills to a level of seniority that you can't handle from an emotional intelligence perspective. Um, so being able to learn emotional intelligence, uh, it's part of the reason I wrote the book, is more of a how-to on emotional intelligence, is a really essential piece of how do you, be, how do you become a great leader uh, especially in the 21st century when it's less of a command and control environment and it's much more focused on how do you actually engage and inspire people with a sense of meaning in their work. So thank you very much. And Jeff, come on up. We're going we're gonna to hang out and do a Q&A now. Thank you. Um, Chip, I think you took us on a little ex unexpected journey. Oh, yeah. This oh, morning. Good. Uh -oh. And, and, and I think all for the better. Okay. Because we all get caught up in our day to day and, and business <laughs> and, and, and what we're going to do with our lives and our careers. And, and we don't always take time to think about you know, our approach to life and how it, how it affects the people around us. So I'm glad you took us on that journey today. Um, but I think we're going to sit now and talk about the hotel business. Yes. Um, you know, you took us a little bit down the career path. And, I think we kind of stopped in 2008 with uh, what happened to Joie de Vivre. Yep. So um, take us to the present. I know there's been some transformation of the company. So to put things into perspective, so we talk about the hotel business for the next 15, 20 minutes or a half hour, whatever we have. Yeah. Uh, tell us where, where the company has gone from here, yes. from 2008. Sure. So um, 2008, challenging recession. Uh, lasted for a couple of years. Uh, things are so much better today. What was clear to me was I needed to solve two things for the company. 
Um, I needed to have deeper pockets in the company uh, because we kept, you know, this is a very, just a very up and down industry and we got into a size where we were the second largest boutique hotelier in the US uh, and, you know, we needed to have deeper pockets. Uh, I also felt we needed deeper pockets for the sake of being able to go out and grow acquisitions wise in terms of going out and buying hotels um, because in, when the market gets bad, you, there are also opportunities to purchase. So that was one piece, is I knew we needed capital. Secondly is I just knew that we needed uh, an environment where I could evolve out of being CEO, still have an, invo an involvement. So in, in 2010, about two years ago, we sold a majority interest, or I sold a majority interest to, um, of the company to John Pritzker, a name that's very familiar in, here in Chicago. Uh, John's father started Hyatt. And uh, J John has had nothing to do with Hyatt for a long time, and in fact has no shares in Hyatt you know, at all anymore. And uh, he bought a majority interest in Joie de Vivre. About three months later, I stepped down as being CEO. For a year, I was executive chairman. And then as of uh, October, uh, Joie de Vivre, John uh, bought uh, an interest in, or bought a majority share of Thompson. Uh, Thompson Hotels, based in New York, merged the companies. Uh, and so we now uh, have a full uh, national platform, an international platform, because Thompson has hotels in Toronto and in London. And, um, and that's where things are. And I'm, I'm still a, a sizable shareholder in the company, and I am uh, an owner in 16 of the hotels that we manage, uh, but I'm not involved in day-to-day -day operations anymore. So the bringing together of Joie de Vivre and Thompson created a company called Commune. Commune, yes. Not Commune, not commune but Commune. commune. And uh, it's a company that's looking to grow. It's, yeah. looking, it's got a new plan for a three-star brand, and mm -hmm. supposedly further acquisitions are on the way. So tell me about the role you're playing in the new company, and, and also address, you know, it seems like you're kind of one foot in, one foot out yeah. uh, of the hotel business. How, how do you manage that, and, and how do you transition in and out, you know, as, a, as an executive? Well, I, I don't transition in and out within Joie de Vivre. I'm, I'm pretty clearly, the only thing I'm doing within Joie de Vivre beyond being an asset manager of the hotels that we manage, uh, that, that Joie de Vivre manages for hotels that we own as, as, as other separate own, uh, owner groups that I'm involved with, is uh, I'm helping to create a hotel in Palo Alto, uh, downtown Palo Alto, next to Facebook's original headquarters. And you know, I went to Stanford, I went to Stanford Business School, so I sort of love Palo Alto. And, uh, and it's a very hot place to be. So we're creating a very interesting hotel there called the Epiphany uh, that'll open about a year from now. And uh, we're doing that with IDEO. IDEO is a big product design firm and it's gonna be a really stunning hotel. Uh, so I like that because I like the idea that, we, that Joie de Vivre, specifically JDV, is continuing to be creative and innovative. So my involvement now within Joie de Vivre is really as a special advisor on things and just on that project. Beyond that, I'm, you know, I'm, still in the hotel business in the sense that I am asked, I have lots of friends in the business and I ask questions a lot and I'm, I am working on a project in Todo Santos, Mexico, which is in Baja. It's an 1,100 acre wellness development that will have some hotels in it uh, and it's gonna be sort of like the wellness capital of the world and I'm very actively involved in that project. But in terms of having a foot in and foot out, the, the, you know, I have, at the end of the day, I love the hotel business, the hospitality business, and as we were talking the other day, earlier this morning, when I got in the business 25 years ago, it was the hospitality business with a small H and a cap, I'm sorry, with a big H and a small B, and today it's a small H and a capital B in the sense that it is more of a business than it is hospitality. And I don't like that. That's not, that's I think an unfortunate path. But it's a path that's long term, it's not gonna change. Uh, because back then, 25 years ago, many, many, many of the hotels were owned by families. The Swig family in San Francisco, and they owned the Fairmont. And uh, today, hotels are more and more owned by private equity firms and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with private equity firms. In fact, John's company that owns a piece of our company is a private equity firm. But it's more focused on short term return investment as opposed to long term. And at the end of the day, I think our relationship in the hospitality business with our guests is a long term relationship. It is not a transactional relationship. It is a transformational relationship, one that transforms 
over time. And I think that, you know, that, that disappoints me at times in terms of where the industry has gone. So we're turning into a more of a business than you know, a focus on, on just pure hospitality. Um, but you've managed to remain entrepreneurial mm -hmm. throughout your career and, and, and still today. So for all the students that are out there, how do you manage to remain entrepreneurial? What is the skill set that's required to remain entrepreneurial in a career that is becoming more focused on, on the bottom line in dollars and cents? So, um, thanks, Jeff. I, I, um, you know, I started the company when I was 26. I had real estate background, zero hotel experience. Never took a hotel class. Didn't know a thing about checking a person into a hotel. Didn't know what a PMS, property management system, was. I didn't know a thing about that. But what I will say is that the word experiment and experience have the same root. And if you can think of your life that way, such that life is just a series of experiments, just like it's a series of experiences, you, if you're doing an experiment, you are willing to fail in an experiment because the nature of how you think of an experiment is that there will be failures and, and learning that comes from it. If you can take that same perspective and apply it toward your experience in your career and your life, you will be more tolerant of failure. And when I was 26 and I started the company, I had to be very tolerant of failure because the likelihood we were going to succeed was actually very low. Um, and then along the way, we've taken a lot of steps. We created this thing called Costa Noa, which is a luxury campground, which is an oxymoron, which is why it failed <laughs> uh, financially. But you know, we've tried a lot of things. And we've said, let's learn, and let's constantly be open to being curious and learn, because that's what life is about. Now, that's a hard path to take if you are a perfectionist or if you are constantly in, have a fear of failure. Um, and so I, I just think in, in, in it's a, almost an axiom that the people who are most creative and innovative have a very high tolerance for failure. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not, I mean, I, you know, the team who works with me would sort of say, yeah, Chip's pretty driven and pretty high standards of wanting success. So it doesn't mean you don't want that too, you do but it just means you're willing to actually try things and maybe do things that sort of sound a little bit crazy occasionally just to see how it works. For us, we got to a size as an organization where we could start beta testing things. Let's try something in that hotel, see how it works. If it works well, maybe we could apply it el elsewhere. Um, and so just trying small, tra you know, making small bets on something was one of our ways to actually stay entrepreneurial. Okay, the luxury tent didn't work. But give me an example of something you did, a little bit crazy, a little bit different, not very much entrepreneurial, that was that did work, and, and tell us about it, why it worked. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I could use a specific practical example, but I actually want to use a broader one for a moment to go back to something you used in your um, introduction, because it's actually language that's now become very familiar within the boutique hotel world, and maybe more broadly, uh, even the Marriotts are talking about it today. About 25 years ago, we started our first hotel, and each hotel is based upon a magazine and five adjectives. So that first hotel, the Phoenix, a rock and roll hotel, was based upon Rolling Stone magazine, and the five adjectives were funky, irreverent, adventurous, cool, and young at heart. And so what I started saying 25 years ago when people thought I was crazy was that we are connecting with our customer on a psychographic basis as opposed to a demographic basis. Demographics are what we look like on the outside, Psychographics is how we feel about ourselves and see ourselves. What we saw with the Phoenix is that the people who fell in love with the Phoenix, this funky, irreverent, adventurous, cool, and young at heart hotel, saw that the hotel was almost a mirror for their aspirations of how they saw themselves, and they got what I would call an identity refreshment by staying in the hotel. When they checked out three days later, they felt more funky, irreverent, or adventurous. Now that's not for everybody in this room. It's a small, like three percent of the population would like the Phoenix, but what the trend has been, and what has really been a shift for the industry, is to move to a place where how do we connect with our customers beyond demographics, more psychographically, and more, and create more of an emotional connection, 
as opposed to just a physical connection. We were talking earlier today about the fact that when people are, when you're a new traveler, in, in the 1950s is when the chain hotel started in the US with Holiday Inn, what people wanted was predictability and, and consistency because a lot of people in the US with a new interstate highway system were traveling for the first time. And they were staying in hotels and motels for the first time. And when you're trying for a product for the first time, you want something that's gonna be consistent. Today, we have more sophisticated travelers, and they're looking for something more than that. And they're looking for a hotel or that's like their perfect habitat, or that is a mirror for how they see themselves. And when I see ad campaigns for Kimpton or others saying, hotels as unique as you are, or Ian Schrager saying, uh, you are where you sleep. Those la that language is exactly what I was saying 25 years ago. And it all comes back to psychology of understanding the psychology of the customer. And knowing that, but 25 years ago when we were talking this way, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, customers want a clean, you know, clean room, comfortable bed. And then for the longest time in the boutique hotel business, it was customers just want cutting edge design. They just want cutting edge design. That was what boutique hotels were all about. And you know, I think what we've come to realize is that cutting edge design is one component of a bigger story of what people are looking for. So. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about emotions this morning, and certainly the emotions of your customers have been on a roller coaster ride probably right. since about 2008 when mm -hmm. Lehman collapsed. That's kind of the, the, the moment yep. uh, that everybody points to. So considering... Funny enough, ironically, the, the day that Lehman collapsed in September, was the day that our 15th hotel of the 15 that we were opening opened the Waterfront Hotel in Oakland. We had our grand opening party that night. Nice. <laughs> so after having 15 hotels open in 21 months, it was the day Gleam and it was like, okay, it's an end of the world party. We had a lot of fun that night. And a lot, a lot, of, of, a lot of people got really drunk. Um, um, so how are you adjusting? Tell me you know, how you play on the emotions of your customers, maybe a little differently today versus 2008. Well, I, you know, everybody's a shopper. You know, when, after 9-11, what I learned was everybody, our, our loyal customers all of a sudden flocked to Expedia and Hotwire and everywhere else like that because that was the new place to, to buy your hotels and it was like the Walmart of hotel experiences because you got the best collection of choices at the lowest prices. Um, that's still true today. What's changed in the industry is that all of a sudden in certain markets, including Chicago now, uh, is that the market, the supply and demand is now starting to move in the direction of the control is, of the suppliers, the hoteliers, and prices are going up a lot. But for the longest time, we've really trained our customers to say, be a bargain shopper. Go out and you know, bargain shop for your hotel. I think what, what, what I'm seeing more and more is that you know, whether it's in the world of transactions, whether it's the transactions of those online travel sites, whether it's the transactions of loyalty programs you know, and airline points. At the end of the day, this is an old school business. It's all about the relationship. It's the relationship that's created between you, but when I say you, I mean you, your front desk staff. You know, your front desk staff, your bellman, the people who are having the face-to-face -face contact with the customer. You create an environment where those people feel loved and appreciated and your customers are going to feel loved and appreciated. And so, uh, you know, yes, social media is a whole new era that is changing the hospitality business, but it is not changing the core basic premise. If you treat your staff really well and your st staff treats your customer really well, you'll do really well in social media. You don't have to go out and take day-long seminars to understand how to actually master social media. What you need to master is the guest experience and most importantly, the employee experience. Because how, how we ever thought that we could, create, we could treat our employees like dirt and then have them go treat our guests like kings and queens makes no logical sense to me at all. So. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, you know, from my perspective, hoteliers such as you and, and other independents, that you kind of set the trends. You are the ones who take the risk, who do things different, and then you find the big brands will follow, and that's always the way it works. Yep. Um, and the perfect example is what Starwood, a big hotel company, created with its W brand. Yep. Um, 
So from your perspective, uh, what's next? What's, what's going to be hot? What, what do you like or what do you see coming down the pike for, for hotels? Well, I, I think, I, let me, I mean, I'll give you two answers. One is in the boutique space, I think there's an enormous opportunity and I'm excited for John Pritzker and for me as a shareholder that the world's becoming a small, it's becoming a smaller world and people are traveling globally more often and there's an enormous growing middle class uh, in places like Poland and Brazil and uh, Vietnam and of course China and India. And the opportunity is that the, the world is full of independent hotels. Chain hotels dominate the US, they do not dominate the world. And so I think the idea of a global boutique hotel company where you could go to one website and say, I'm going to, you know, like I was in, you know, Guayaquil, Ecuador, three days ago. I'm going to Guayaquil, and I want to go stay in a cool boutique hotel in, in Guayaquil, Ecuador, that's part of a global group, a good boutique group, um, is, I think, a great opportunity. So that's sort of one opportunity, but that's not product specific. I think product specific, more and more people are going to look for places to completely escape. Uh, the more we are barraged with our iPhones and our, all the forms of communication that we have, including email, the more we feel sort of just like that's overload, the more we have to put boundaries on them. And I think that the idea of these resorts that are almost places where you check your iPhone at the front desk when you check in, or they don't actually even have internet service. Uh, it goes back to the old school. Um, that I think that those are going to become more and more popular as long as they're immersive experiences where in the three days that you're there, you feel like you just got completely renewed as if you'd taken a six-month sabbatical. Because I do think that that's what's, you know, what's true of culture today is that everything's sped up. And the way, the, the way life works is there's always got to be a balance. And with all this speed that we have here, the question is what's going to be the balance? And in the hospitality business, what we've tried to do is just keep sped up to catch up to our customer, and that's important. But I think there'll be an opportunity where people can go and say, oh, I'm just going to go, do, go to that, re that resort collection they have where all you do is you spend three days there and you completely rebalance yourself based upon recalibrating yourself back to a slower speed. And um, I think that's an opportunity that we'll have as an, as an industry. What, what about more from a product standpoint? I understand that's a, more of an emotional uh, mm -hmm. amenity. Um, maybe food and beverage, design, technology. What are you seeing that you really, really has caught your attention? What well, do you what like? Where are we heading? What's catching my attention is things that are immersive experiences where people actually feel connected. There's these interesting hotel resorts that are in farms and people can go out into the field and actually work with the farmers for the day and then they go and, and cook their meal that night from the stuff that they actually harvested from the day. More and more, it's again, it's, it's old school. It's taking things back to a different place. It's connecting people to a community, going and staying in a cool hotel in um, Bogota, Colombia, that's in an arts neighborhood where the concierge takes you out for a two hour arts tour once a day and you get to go backstage with people and understand you know, their little galleries and see things that you haven't seen otherwise. I, I think what people are looking more and more for is these sort of small intimate experiences that give them this, the opportunity to get their hands dirty a little bit uh, because so much of our life is you know, lived up here uh, that it helps people to actually go and experience things that um, allow them to ex uh, experiment with parts of their life that they don't get to use very often. So I, you know, that's, I know that's pretty broad and abstract, but um, I, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat reluctant to say there's a specific product. At the same time, we're creating this Epiphany Hotel you know, in, in, in Palo Alto that is going to be the most fascinating meetings-driven hotel in the, in the world and with all kinds of ways to connect and create epiphanies. It's like our, our brand promise is you, you check in with us and you're going to have an epiphany. That's a pretty high brand promise in terms of what that hotel is going to be able to offer. But we're working with this group, IDEO, that helped create Apple's computer mouse originally and has 
the best in the world at creating design for anything, and I'm pretty proud of that too. So we're try, you know, we're looking at trying to press the boundaries there as well. You know, I, I have some more questions. I don't know how much time we have we have left. I, I want to make sure that the audience, if there's anybody out there who wants to ask Chip anything, you know, before I ask any other questions, is there any questions that want to come out of the audience? If anybody wants to stand up and, and ask something, and uh, well, I'm I'm we'll go to the late woman. Can you tell us who you are first? Hold, hold on one second. We want to get you a microphone. A nutritional question, since we're at Kendall. Chip, what vitamins do you take? <laughs> I have to know. Well, why, I, I, why are you asking that? Um, that okay. Uh, <laughs> I take multiple vitamins. Uh, there's a company called Isogenics, and they have a male-oriented set of multiple vitamins. I take five in the morning and four at night. And uh, that's what I do. Uh, but I, I will say that exercise, I think, keeps me young, too. And I, and I meditate. So the meditation helps as well. Right up here in the front. I have a question regarding your employees. You have here a wonderful uh, potential ones in this Generation Y hoteliers. Mm -hmm. Do you see a change you know, 25 years ago? Who were your employees, how they behave, or what their aspirations were in, the, in their careers, and how these young people are behaving today, what their aspirations are, and if you as a hotelier are adjusting to them, is there a difference? Yeah, well, I thank you, it's a good question. Uh, what's very clear, not just in the hospitality business, but just in general, is that younger people uh, think of their life as uh, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook said last week, as a jungle gym, not a ladder. It's not a career ladder, it's a jungle gym. And what that means is that people are not necessarily looking for the linear path of 25 years at Hilton that will ultimately get them to become a general manager. Uh, they are open to and interested in moving around, trying different things with different companies, uh, and being open to the fact that they will not know where they're going to be 15 years from now or, or five years from now. They also want an, a, an opportunity to feel like they've got a voice and an opportunity to have some level of leadership relatively young in their career. And uh, so these are the desires uh, of, of younger people today, today and that the employers that are able to both create an environment where young people can actually have a voice and feel like they're empowered, feel like they can actually get into leadership relatively early. So many of our hotels are smaller hotels, which allow for that, which is a good thing. Um, create an environment where there's a lot of learning going on. And then also create an environment where someone feels like, well, I don't have to stick around this place for 20 years to actually get to you know, whatever I'm trying to get to. Uh, that's good too. I've always thought of Joie de Vivre as an incubator for entrepreneurs, and I like that idea. I always will like that idea. Uh, some people, some other s leaders have said, well, that's silly. You're hiring people, you're going to train them, they're going to work for three or four years, and then they're going to become a competitor, or they're going to go out and start a restaurant, or they're going to go out and start their own management company. Our director of operations for the company started a, a hotel management company in LA uh, many years ago. I love that. You know, I want people who are passionate. I want people who are going to be excited about what they're doing. And if they're not going to be excited in the context of working with us, or, or they had excitement, but now they want to go do their own thing, great. You know, it's not like we have a lot of trade secrets. If we were a high tech company, it might be filled different. Someone stealing trade secrets that, you know, what, our trade secret is being nice. Okay? That's my trade secret, you know. I'll, 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 you know, I'll give that, and I write books about it, so I, it's not a trade secret. Okay, one last question I'm going to ask you, um, yeah. Chip, is, you know, we've got a lot of students here, and virtually, give them one quick piece of advice about their budding hotel careers. Well, you know, I just wrote a blog on Huffington Post that was just po posted in the last few days, and I outlined five pieces of management etiquette. I'm not going to tell you all five of them. But let me just give you a couple of them. 
uh, that I think are really relevant. Number one is be radically responsive. And what I mean by that is, and, and, and again, the guys in the back will know this, I do my best to respond to an email as quickly as possible. More importantly, if someone is upset at you, whether it's an employee, whether it's a customer, whomever it is, the moment you see that, whether it's on your, your, your PDA, whether it's at your laptop, whether it's a voicemail you've gotten, drop everything, respond within 10 minutes. That doesn't mean you have the answer. But again, I'm looking at James. So many times, the worst thing you could ever do, here's what happens, it's so still, silly. Leaders get some, an angry guest, the perfect example. Guest has a terrible experience. They send an email to the CEO. They don't necessarily, they're so upset they expect that they're not going to get a response. When they get a response within 10 minutes after hitting send from the CEO saying, I am so sorry. I really apologize for what happened. I don't know the details. I need to find the details out. I have copied James Lim on this. He's the regional director for that area, and he's GM uh, managing director for one of our hotels. James and I will talk about it, and either James or I will get back to you within the next 24 hours. Do we do that, James? We do that all the time. That is better, I, mean, I hate to say this to a hospitality uh, institution, but that's better than any education you can get from any class. Because the bottom line is, we all want to feel respected. And when we're feeling angry about something, whether it's an employee or, or as a customer, the ultimate sign of disrespect is when you actually put something out there and you don't hear from anybody for a day or two or ever. And what happens with a leader is they get that email and they say, oh, I better do my investigation of this. And three or four days later, they've not responded and they've actually forgotten about the problem. And they finally hear back five days later from people, oh, here's what happened. And then they get back to the customer and the customer's had five more days to write 20 social media posts about how they hate that hotel. And at that point, the customer has psychologically put themselves in a position of being a terrorist. And no matter what you do for the customer at that point, they're not going to actually be very responsive to you. So that was a very tactical suggestion, but one that I will just sort of summarize by saying, it's all about respect. How do you pay respect to people? When it comes to being a leader, it's learning how to listen. Not, I'm a great talker. I'm really good at getting up and talking in front of people, and I do tend to talk more than I listen. So I, I don't take my advice on this as much as I should. But learning how, James is a spectacular listener. And knowing how to listen is knowing how to respect. And knowing how to respect is understanding, again, psychology, and understanding that people, they say, people will not remember what you said, They'll, rem you'll, they'll remember how they made you feel. And when it comes to leadership, that's probably the best advice I could give you, is just remember how you're going to make people feel. Great. A lot of good life lessons today. I think we're out of time. Chip, thank you. Pleasure to have you here. And thank you for the audience. Thank you, Jeff.